for those of you who may not be familiar with IPA, um, we're a organization that really is focused around building better evidence on challenges and issues uh, central to development. And we work across a wide range of domains and um, this consumer protection initiative is part of our financial inclusion program where we are really trying to um, push the frontiers of evidence on what works and what the, um, how we can maximize the potential benefit of financial inclusion um, across the world. The Consumer Protection Research Initiative itself is our, our newest program within the Financial Inclusion Program. And it's a four-year project funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, where we are seeking to both identify and diagnose what are the challenges or risks people may face uh, using new digital financial services. And then also, what are the solutions we can build to reduce the harm or the potential risk of these consumer protection challenges. And so we're starting with four markets, um, but hopefully uh, as we build the evidence, we can expand and, tran um, and transfer some of these insights to other markets across the globe. Um, for those who may be interested in collaborating with us, um, you know, the doors are always open and we're, um, we're focusing on two kinds of research. The first is market monitoring data analysis. So this is really about sizing the challenges in consumer protection and about identifying new data sources we can leverage to better understand um, these risks. And that includes things such as using administrative data um, from things like mobile payments or digital credit um, to build indicators on uh, consumer protection, uh, doing surveys to hear directly from consumers, their experiences, and using new data sources such as social media to monitor consumer experiences. And we're very excited to share that starting in January, we'll be entering into the second phase of this program where we'll be um, both conducting and funding impact evaluations uh, to test solutions in consumer protection. And so if you have interest in that phase of the work or in any of these research ideas, please um, email us at financialinclusion at povertyaction.org. And we'd be happy to, um, to discuss this further. So now on to the reason you, you came today. Um, we're going to um, have a great, a great series of um, sessions and discussions with experts in the, in the domain of, um, of algorithmic scoring, of ethics and data, and digital finance. And so first we will hear from Kathy O'Neill, um, who is the CEO of, of Orca um, Consulting, and then we will, um, and she will talk about um, her views on um, both weapons of math destruction and how we might work on developing ethical matrix matrices for um, for work in digital finance and other work um, use, using uh, big data. And then um, her colleague uh, Jacob Apple, the chief strategist, will speak on um, a particular issue within uh, within data and ethics around proxy variables. Um, and so um, Jake will present that and then I'll turn it over to uh, a panel of, of experts uh, from the digital finance space to share their perspectives. Um, we've got, we have Paul Welton, um, Chief Information Analytics Officer for Jumo, one of the leading uh, fintechs across Africa and Asia, and Malavika Raghavan, who's an independent expert on um, data protection, uh, consumer, consumer protection, and digital finance. Uh, and um, was the head of the Future Finance Initiative at, at Devara, um, Devara Trust until recently. And then we will have plenty of time for a uh, question and answer. So uh, we're hoping we'll have, a, um, have the ability for you to ask a range of questions and have a robust discussion. Um, so, so now, um, without further ado, I will turn it over to, um, to Kathy, who will kick, kick things off. So I only have 15 minutes. I'm going to blow through this uh, relatively quickly. Um, but I wanted to just give you a very quick overview of, uh, you know, the way that Orca thinks about algorithms and what can go wrong and how we approach uh, auditing. So first I'm going to describe what I think of as 
well, what I define as weapons of math destruction, which are widespread important algorithms, predictive algorithms, usually scoring systems that uh, decide whether somebody deserves something, whether they're worthy of something, whether it's a loan or get to college or a job or getting fired. People in question, the targets of this us to those people, they don't understand them. They often uh, cannot appeal them. And mistakes are often made, as you can imagine, um, but they don't know it often. Um, and it's not just destructive for the individuals as uh, we normally see, but sort of, you know, destructive in a larger sense. Often they undermine their own uh, goals. But the, the characteristic for a they, they score people improperly, and those people, again, don't understand it, cannot appear contextual. A scoring system that is evil in one context could be really good in another. Favorite example here is diabetes risk scores. People could be scored for their risk of getting type 2 diabetes. Um, if that's in the hands of your doctor who, you know, takes care to make sure your A1C levels um, are managed, that would be good. But if it's, in the, if it's in the hands of an insurance company that will price you out of health insurance, that could be the opposite of good. That could mean you, that, that you get sick and don't have any medical care. So it's very contextual. I don't really, uh, it's a little bit of a misnomer to say we audit algorithms. We audit algorithms in a given context where the output of the algorithm is used in a specific way. I also wanna mention that most of the harm that algorithms cause are unintentional harms. Um, there's typically no data scientist sitting s somewhere in a back room uh, with an evil plan. That sometimes happens, but it's not often the case. And the final thing is that I, I kind of mentioned this earlier, the feedback loops are critically important that we don't just see mistakes on an individual basis, but we see systemic mistakes that create ongoing feedback loops where, you know, the history of redlining gets embedded in the data and the, the redlining continues unintentionally, but truly. So that's, that's what a weapon of math destruction is, a pretty evil algorithm. It can be, uh, that's the sort of the triage that we sometimes build. I just want to give an example of the kind of, a, re, a recent example, um, it's called the Optum Healthcare Algorithm. And basically it was costs, basically it was trying to predict uh, patients that would have a lot of complicated medical situations with lots of cost. And uh, again, they used historical algorithms, historical data to build an algorithm to predict future cost. And they were aiming to, to pair the people that were at high risk uh, with, um, with, with sort of their own personal um, managers or case managers. And the idea was the case managers would help them navigate the system, help them get better medical care, et cetera. It was a good thing to get paired with one of these managers. But because of the historical bias um, and, and in particular the way that uh, there's racism in the medical profession or medical industry, Black people, black patients did, just didn't get as much care even when they were very sick. So in other words, the choice that they were optimizing, they were sort of black patients who should have gotten more care, i.e. should have cost more, didn't. And the result was that this sick so there's a historical bias that is propagated um, into the algorithm, which is supposed to work in the future. So that's how sort of past injustices get propagated by algorithms. It's very simple um, when you think until it was uh, sort of a journalist actually uh, and a medical a research team and a journalist got together and, and, and found, found it out and sort of um, made it known through some sleuthing using hospital data. So um, I know I only have 15 minutes. So I'm gonna jump into the way that we think about 
auditing algorithms. And the, and <laughs> the question that like the optimal algorithm or other algorithms, you're like, well, what were people thinking? And the answer is that they were thinking it was working for them. So, so we have to broaden that question up. The ethical matrix is essentially a way to broaden that question. Does your algorithm work? And instead of asking, does your algorithm work? You, the people that built the algorithm, you ask for whom does this algorithm work? And for whom does this algorithm fail? And what kind of failure happens to those people? Um, so the idea here is that we're not having, we're not going directly into the code or directly into statistics. We're having a non-technical conversation. And it sort of forces us to think about what are our values explicitly. That's why it's called the ethical matrix because it's very values laden. Um, the end result when you build the ethical matrix is just the artifact of a conversation about values and about who are the stakeholders and what does it mean for them that this has failed or, or succeeded. And to be clear, I'm not saying the ethical matrix once you've built it solves your problems. It doesn't, it highlights your problems and it shows you sort of like a, the top five things that you should care about. So the goal of the ethical matrix is to highlight what are the most critical potential problems with this matrix, with this algorithm in its context, what could go wrong and how do we address it? Um, and to be a little bit more explicit, the rows are the stakeholders and the columns are their concerns. That's why it's called a matrix because it's a two by two array. You should, I mean, a, a two dimensional array, kind of like an Excel spreadsheet. The stakeholders in question should be represented in the conversation. So, you know, where them, the, there should be people representing the viewpoint um, and the perspective of Black patients, um, and of course, other patients as well. We consider every cell in that matrix once we have built the rows and the columns, and we think through to what extent will this pose a major existential problem for this algorithm. And then once we have sort of bad things to get, we rank those concerns and then we try to address them one by one. So I think of this as a very practical way of addressing ethical dilemmas by giving you a couple of case studies. And the first one comes from credit. I know you guys are thinking through microfinance and other kinds of uh, fintech issues. Um, and there's this, this is a coming from an appendix of a paper by Maurice Hart and others uh, talking about um, uh, fairness in machine learning. And the critical point they're making here is that we do not have, especially in credit, um, so what does it mean for an algorithm to, to be racist? Because of course, a lot of people are accusing that the Optum folks of racism, there's lots of other examples with crime risk scores. This is racist, this is racist. And people will come back and say, no, it's not racist according to our definition. So they, these guys in this appendix um, went straight to that, the heart of that matter and said, well, what are the different, different possible definitions of racist algorithms and how do they differ? And the first constraints, I should say, however you define them, will cut down on profit. Um, and this is kind of a complicated graph, but what this is showing us is they have basically five different definitions of race, of a constraint for racism. So what they're basically doing here is they're, they're imagining a credit company that offers um, loans to different people. Um, but they have a constraint that they cannot, you know, offer loans in a racist way. But they don't just have one version of that constraint, they have five. And one of them is the empty constraint. So the, um, you optimize to profit with a constraint of a single threshold, which means, you know, everyone has to pass a certain score, kind of, you can think of it as a FICO score. And above that, um, above that, uh, you, you can, get the loan, et cetera. But anyway, there's stronger and stronger constraints. Um, demography, I, and I won't go into the definitions, but the point is that they're, they get str uh, progressively stronger. This graph shows the extent to which your profit is cut in on when you, when you adopt one of these constraints. So as you can see, the stronger your constraint gets, the more your profit cut gets cut. Um, the point of this, of course, is that you know 
when you put a constraint on your optimization to profit, you are going, is that no individual company that tries to profit profit off of loans will volunteer for a constraint like this. And they certainly won't volunteer the, for the strongest constraint. So whenever we're having that conversation about what does it mean to be racist, we should keep in mind that there's a very strong incentive for companies to adopt the weakest or maybe the, the, the null constraint um, in, in w when they agree to any kind of constraint whatsoever. So the standard ethical matrix uh, for, for, uh, for this situation is, as you say, hey company, are you, does your algorithm work? Does your algorithm that decides who, how do you know it works? And they're gonna say, because we optimize to profit and that's our definition of success. So this is like what I call the snuff, that's the point. The point is that you have to, you have to expand your definition of for whom does this work, for whom does this fail? And you have to have a revised ethical matrix. And so, uh, and, and again, I've color coded this for like how much, to what extent do people, should people be concerned that this will fail for them? So you should think of book it out from minority, uh, from customers to minority versus white customers. And you see that the white, the minority customers here do have concerns. Um, by the way, the matrix that I drew based on that appendix that I mentioned in that paper. So the, the point they're making there is that fairness is a concern, but in particular, the way they define fairness is false negatives. So the minority customers should be concerned about false negatives, which is to say that they should get a loan, but they're not getting a loan. And moreover, the appendix goes on to say, the reason that the minority customers should be concerned about false negatives is because the data quality for minority customers is just not as good as the data quality for white customers. So that they tend to be less seen by the data, they're, the data isn't as good. So because they're less seen, they, they typically don't get the benefit of the doubt and they don't get the loan. So this is the, uh, the, this is the sort of ethical matrix that I drew based on that, um, based on that appendix. But what I like about it, you can see like, what is the issue? What is the, what is the existential risk of this, of this uh, ethical risk of this situation? Um, so that's just one example where you see what the rows of the columns look like, you see the color coding. I just want to point out, last thing I'll do is uh, point to answer any of the question. Oh, wait, like pretty quickly, if not immediately, if they had gone to the trouble of building the ethical matrix, they would have said, oh, do we think about customers that historically have not um, been tr medically treated to the full extent that they should have, then they would have immediately realized that people like that, and that of course that more black people who are underinsured, the, those people will have um, uh, historically been uh, neglected. And uh, this algorithm would of course pick up on neglect and propagate it into the future. My point being that if Optum had, had chosen to build an uh, ethical matrix, they would have seen this coming and they would have hopefully said, we have to build a better, uh, better definition of success based hopefully on something like the severity of their medical condition rather than just how much they ended up getting uh, treated. I would like to also point out that I'm, I'm sure you guys have heard um, or if you haven't heard, you should immediately go to see the gender shades study on facial recognition that was run by um, my good friends, Joy Bolomini and uh, Deb Raji and also Timnit Gabru, who just was became famous last week for getting fired by Google. We can talk about that in Q&A. Um, anyway, they worked together to audit the facial recognition software available by IBM, Amazon and Microsoft, among others. They found that uh, the accuracy was much worse for black women than for white men. Um, in general, it was worse for darker skin tones and it was worse for women. Um, great, another great example, accuracy, that was their definition of success, accuracy, overall accuracy. If they had instead asked for whom does this fail, it would have been quite obvious uh, very quickly 
because they could have run this test themselves. They didn't need to wait for outsiders to do it, but they did. As women, does this work as well for darker skinned people as well for lighter skinned people? They just failed to ask it. So it's kind of a no brainer. The ethical matrix isn't supposed to be rocket science. It's supposed to say, hey, think through what could go wrong. Another example being the Apple card. Um, this, this is a card that Apple um, was advertising with the backing from Goldman Sachs. The idea was like, we're gonna give you, uh, based on our big data profiling of you, um, an enormous uh, credit um, very quickly. And it was found to be um, sexist um, by a bunch of super users um, who found that they and their wives um, you know, have the sort of the same, or they, they consider the same or equivalent profiles financially, but for some reason they got 10 times more credit than their wives. Um, the final uh, example I wanna tell you is coming from a child abuse hotline. So this has nothing to do with FinTech, but what I want to show this to you for is I just wanted to ex explain the extent to which the, the ethics is, uh, is is highlighted when you build an ethical matrix. I won't explain everything to you here, but the short version is it's a it's a child abuse hotline, and all things, sorts of things can go wrong in a, in this situation where people are calling in with reports about suspected child abuse. It could be it could be not child abuse, uh, it could be uh, not reported enough, all sorts of things can happen. But what I want you to look at is this go for children for false negatives. False positives refer to when a child is, when a family is over suspected of abusing a child. So the child is taken from their home without cause. That of course is a tragedy for the children and the families because they should be with their family. And this, the, sometimes this algorithm picks up on poverty as a signal instead of actual abuse. So it will happen much more likely to poor families. Okay, so false positives is when a child should be taken from their home, but the algorithm doesn't recognize that child situation as urgent. Also, so they're basically being abused, but being left to, to with their abusers. Also a tragedy for the child. Um, so the question, so the, obviously the children are very concerned with both of these issues. And the question you'd ask is, well, how, what's the, you know, how bad is one compared to the other? Like how many of these false positives would you trade for a false negative? You know, we I probably all imagine that false negatives are worse than false positives, but how many would you trade for the one for the other? And make mistakes both in the false positive direction and the false negative direction. So anytime you build an algorithm, you are implicitly choosing a ratio there. You're implicitly choosing, I trade one for the other. You can't make them both go to zero. Um, but the question is, are you having that explicit conversation about your values? And that is the point of the ethical matrix. I just wanted to show you that one example where it's so crystal clear. There is a trolley problem here. We have to think through it. We can't just throw an algorithm at this and assume it's all working. Out. Excellent. Thank you so much, Kathy. Jake, over to you for a deep dive on proxy variables. Awesome. Um, I'm trying a fairly high tech thing involving calling in by phone and sharing the screen. Can folks see the proxy variables presentation? Yes. 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 And can you yeah, also hear my voice? Great. Um, well, good morning, afternoon, and evening, depending where in the world you are today. Um, I'm going to it's a little bit of a deep dive uh, into a, a somewhat one key topic, but you know, time precludes me from getting too wonky, which is lucky for all of us. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about proxy variables and how um, they relate to consumer protection. And we could think of proxy variables as kind of uh, one concern or issue that might be uncovered, put this in the context of, you know, Kathy's presentation. So first, let me just pick some ideas. What do I mean by proxy variables? Um, 
Uh, what I mean is X is a proxy for Y. If knowing X, I can make a good guess about Y. So it's just a thing that tells me something, uh, it tells me about another characteristic a person has. Um, uh, from the economics literature, we like think of about uh, years of schooling as a proxy for a future, like uh, someone's social graph, you know, who they are friends with on Facebook or who they follow on Twitter as a proxy for their political party affiliation, you know, it's the kind of thing uh, researchers looking to nowadays. Um, so this is obviously a loose definition, you know, it immediately prompts a couple of questions, like how good of a guess uh, does, do I have to be able to make to consider something a proxy? Um, and then there's the issue of kind of complex proxies. It's not just, uh, for instance, years of schooling is a simple, like single, it's a single number, but something like my social graph um, is not necessarily easy to represent, you know, just in a single number or index. So, um, so there are complexities about what a proxy is, but the basic idea is if I know it, then I can guess something else about you. Um, to the issue of consumer protection, uh, it matters because of anti-discrimination laws, really. In the U.S., at least, we have um, kind of a patchwork of anti-discrimination laws, uh, but they cover a, a bunch of different industries or areas of life, like credit, um, housing, insurance, hiring, and more. And in general, it, at least in the U.S., the laws are uh, written around protected classes. So there's a list of um, 11 or 12 or 13, I forget exactly how many, protected classes like age, race, ethnicity, uh, country of origin. Um, those are uh, characteristics that you're not allowed to discriminate based on. So that's the rule. Um, and then recently, the, issue, the, the kind of... Um, the world of big data has transformed the way that decisions are made in all of those areas, like who gets credit, uh, whether you you know get a mortgage, etc. In particular, um, the models are much bigger than they used to be, so they're not just linear regressions. To, you know, to give your credit score, they're very complex models that have hundreds or thousands or many thousands of variables, um, and those models are fed by really uh, extensive data on individuals. So um, available from, for instance, like credit reporting agencies, but also from data brokers um, that can give not just like my details on my income from past years, but also my spending habits and also media consumption. So we have this really wide data on individuals um, that's being fed into really complex models. And the third point on this slide is, is sort of the combination of the first two points. The fact is that our, um, our like protected class information, our race, our gender, is actually reflected in so many other things. You know, our gender is uh, guessable based on the movies that we watch or our spending habits, um, that it becomes really hard to hide from protected class information uh, when using these, uh, someone who's trying to make loans, like how do I avoid being sexist or avoid being racist while still using all this juicy data that we have on the individuals? So that's the kind of motivating question here. Um, and in the, the remaining time I have, I'm just going to uh, very quickly talk about five ways of dealing with this problem, five suggested ways. Um, none of them is perfect, and I'm going to, you know, kind of point out some of the um, gaps in each one. So the first way you might try to deal with it is um, just not to deal with it. So it's like uh, I would call this the head in the sand approach. It's like you say, I'm not going to use um, race here in the rest of these examples. I'll use race. I'll talk about race as a um, example of protected class. So a lender's like, I don't want to be uh, racist in my uh, lending decisions. So what I'm going to do is just scrub the race variable out of my data set. I'm going to make sure that when I train a predictive model, I'm not training it on race data, and I'm just, um, I'm not going to pay any attention to race at all. So then I couldn't be racist, right? 
um, the answer is wrong. You still can be racist. And um, this paper by Gillis and Spice or Spice, um, I never know how to say that, uh, it shows us that the figure on the slide here um, uh, is showing the results that they, they really tried to take this naive approach. They took a data set of uh, home mortgage applications that includes the data set includes um, race information on the applicants. And they estimated or they built a predictive model on that data set three different ways. On the left, they built a model using all the information, including the race variable. In the middle, they built a model using most of the information. They just left out the race variable. And on the right, they um, removed the race variable and the 10 closest proxies, closest correlates in their data set for the race variable. So they were like trying to scrub it out even more thoroughly on the right. The payoff of these three figures is that they look approximately the same, and they show that their predictive model um, still made race-specific um, uh, predictions despite not having access to the race variable or even close correlates. So they just are showing here that it's not good enough to pretend to ignore uh, race. It can still seep into the predictions of the model. So um, idea number one is not uh, just doesn't work, unfortunately. So what about idea number two? Uh, Pope and Snyder suggest this other approach. They say, all right, if you have race data, then you should incorporate it into your predictive model. Um, you can use it while training that model. But then when you want to go and make predictions for individuals, they say just treat every individual the same. Like treat, instead of plugging in an individual's actual race into the model for that to spit out a prediction, just use the same race for everybody. Or use, you know, if we we're talking about um, age, you can just use the average age for everybody. So that's a um, nice enough suggestion in that it, uh, what it's trying to do is make sure that the signal about the sensitive variable like race doesn't um, sneak into the model through some other correlated variables. Unfortunately, the, this approach can't make any guarantees about the fairness of outcomes from a model, um, much like the last idea. Like we can, we can to some extent, uh, say that uh, any unfairness in outcomes is coming through a correlate instead of coming through the race, you know, variable itself. But it doesn't guarantee that um, that the outcomes will themselves be fair. So, uh, so it's not good enough to uh, to build a you know, for instance, a regulatory regime around. Um, So a related idea, uh, related in the sense that it's kind of an attempt to technically scrub um, information about the sensitive variable out of the model, is, um, is proposed by Bartlett and others from uh, uh, UC Berkeley. Um, I'm not going to go through the technical. Their proposal is to sort of identify the variables that um, that actually matter to the decision you want to make. So they're, they're looking at a, an example of credit, and they're saying, what are the credit macro risk variables? You know, the things about a person that truly make them credit worthy or not. They're saying, first, make a list of all those um, macro risk variables, and then kind of scrub them out, um, uh, scrub out the signal of those from all the other variables in the model, and then finally comb through and see if there are residual correlations with race. It's a scrubbing procedure. Um, the challenge with this, uh, with this proposal is that um, everybody doesn't agree. With, there's no consensus on the list of credit macro risk variables. There's no consensus on the kind of scrubbing we need to do. Um, so it's uh, people would argue whether a model has been um, passed. It's hard to even complete the first step and do steps two and three of their um, or, uh, idea number three. 
The last two ideas are uh, not technical. They're kind of regulatory in nature. So um, uh, these are things that uh, a regulator with the authority to um, to make rules, these are the kinds of things they can propose and, um, and put in place. So idea number four is um, to flip the default, flip the default from big models to small models. Um, so as I said, you know, way up at the top, uh, one of the kind of motivations or one of the uh, one of the reasons why this issue comes up is that these days we deal with models that have hundreds or thousands of variables um, and that the uh, information about sensitive things like race are kind of uh, seeping into the model through other variables. Well, a regulator could say you can only use four variables or you can the regulator can just explicitly restrict um, what features you're allowed to include in those models. So that, that has been done um, in the Affordable Care Act in the U.S., Obamacare. Um, they, they, the, the law, the Affordable Care Act, um, tells insurers that they can only consider four different variables when setting premiums uh, within a, a certain band of prices. So they just said, you can't build a model with a thousand features. You can have these four features. Um, so that's a pretty strong, uh, strong level of control over the model. Um, but you know, they, they managed to do it sort of politically. They put that, um, that framework of regulation in place. Just below, uh, uh, mentioned California prop one Oh three, um, which is a, a auto insurance example. Um, that's a less extreme than the Affordable Care Act in that the regulator didn't um, say you can only use these these three factors most highly. Um, so my, my point is there are gradations of how extreme the regulator can be here. You could you could literally say here's your list of variables, or you could say you can use more variables, but these ones need to be um, weighted most heavily. You could define exactly what that means. Um, you know, these are all sort of under the rubric of the regulator uh, keeping the models fairly small. Um, so that's a, a fourth idea. And finally, the last idea I'll mention is um, is a focus on outcomes. So the first four ideas that I've, I've talked about are interested in the specific variables or features in these predictive models, um, scrubbing them, saying which ones are allowed or not. There's a different approach which says, you make whatever model you want, I'm gonna look at the outcomes. I'm gonna look at the credit decisions you make and I'm gonna um, assess whether they're fair or unfair. So in the US we have a uh, you know, legal doctrine of disparate impact, which zeroes in on this question exactly. It says um, you can have a, a business practice or a, you know, a credit lending procedure that's um, on its face seems neutral, but if it produces uh, unfair, if it produces disparate outcomes for <clears throat> a particular protected class, then it's uh, illegal. It's not allowed. Um, so that's a you know a legal framework that these areas credit, housing, insurance, um, and to challenge models that you don't even have to point to a particular variable. You you simply point to the fact that this model is disadvantaging um, uh, a, a specific protected class of people. There's then a, a series of follow-up questions. It's for a legitimate business necessity, and there's no um, less uh, discriminatory way to satisfy that necessity. But that follow-up conversation is, um, well, uh, is, is a bit further in the weeds. The, um, the overall concept is there is a legal um, there's a legal space for making an argument that just says um, the outcomes are unfair. And finally, under the you know the same kind of uh, under the same umbrella of focusing on outcomes, there are some examples in the U.S. of just disclosure regimes, which means uh, the regulator telling companies you have to publish or you know otherwise share. Um, uh, you have to share information about the outcomes of your predictive models 
um, so people can study it and comment on it and criticize it. So one example of that is uh, the Home uh, Mortgage Disclosure Act, which requires uh, mortgage lenders in the U.S. to um, to share with the government the details about their applicants and who was approved and denied and the terms that they got. And that um, data that they share includes race and ethnicity data. So it, that's been a you know a real treasure trove for researchers over the years to um, to make claims about what's going on with regard to uh, racism in um, mortgage lending. So from a regulatory perspective, you know that's a way for I think regulators to expose these um, decision makers to some scrutiny. Uh, without being very specific on a, a regulatory regime. They're just saying, make the data available, and um, you know, that stimulates some amount of research and discussion. Um, so that's a lot, but I'll end there, uh, and you know, hopefully we'll uh, come to some of these topics in discussion. Thanks, everybody. And I'll stop sharing my screen. Excellent. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Jake. That was wonderful. And thank you so much, Kathy. Um, and I'm seeing we're getting some good questions in now. Please uh, start start sending in your questions uh, to the chat um, because after um, we speak with Malavika, we will have an open question and answer. Um, and so, so now, as I mentioned, I will turn it over to um, to a, pan a discussion between myself and Malavika um, and. Unfortunately, Paul uh, Welpton from Jumo just had a medical emergency as of 20 minutes ago, um, so we're going to miss Paul's perspective. But um, but Malavika and I will um, will share our thoughts and experiences, um, and we wish Paul a uh, speedy speedy recovery. Um, so Malavika, thank you so much for joining us. Um, you know, I know this is a topic area you've been working diligently on for the past, I don't know, five years or, um, or more. And um, it's something that in the context of your work in India has come up a lot, um, a lot of really robust debates around data, data protection and, um, and financial services. And so I was hoping to maybe get you to, um, to bring these, um, these issues that uh, Kathy and Jake have raised into the context of lower income consumers in emerging markets. Um, and so the first question I wanted to ask is, thinking particularly, right, of the markets we work in, the consumer segments we're focusing on in financial inclusion, um, what are some of the biases um, that you think may be um, particularly concerning um, for the, in the context of the lives of the poor? Thank you, Rafe, for hosting this. And just a quick check that you can hear me okay, uh, just because I'm having some bandwidth issues. Yes. Otherwise, I'll turn off my video. Okay. Just let me know and I'll turn off my video. Uh, so thanks a lot. I mean, uh, just to bring this back, I must caveat, uh, obviously for the last four or five years, my focus has very much been uh, on algorithms and AI in the context of consumer finance coming from consumer protection a perspective. And unfortunately, I still have a lot of questions. I have some very small answers. Uh, but I think one of the big, um, I suppose, challenges talking about this in the Indian context is that many financial institutions are using these techniques, right? And there is uh, quite a lot of data-driven finance going on. Uh, however, not a lot of this is reported in any official source, and we don't really have any particular types of reporting systems around what data gets collected for these um, particular algorithms, how they work, uh, how their decisions are audited. So a lot of this um, is based on our kind of uh, anecdotal evidence conversations with providers and so on. Um, that's the big caveat. To, to, to kind of go into details, I think obviously one of the big um, uh, proven uh, you know, benefits of this approach is that it allows us to get over uh, this approach being the use of AI in finance uh, algorithms and specific types of uh, techniques and advanced statistical techniques really is what they are, is to basically use new types of data 
to allow people who traditionally would not be in the financial ecosystem to come in because there's the possibility to use phone data and to use internet data, basically. Those are the two big ones. And increasingly social data, where Facebook is uh, pretty big in India and we have a couple of other uh, sort of um, local platforms. Uh, but using these kind of data sources, can we do something that where in a country where credit scoring is not as universal, especially amongst lower income groups, right? So that was the big first big um, opportunity and it's very much happening. So we have multiple lenders who, um, uh, mul multiple credit scorers who actually sell their uh, decision engines to banks and financial institutions. And so they don't really curate that loan on their own books, which is the first thing I'll flag to the audience. I'm sure many of you, I can recognize lots of names, deal with this issue where that's the first incentive gap that starts emerging, right? Because the person making the credit decision um, is often outside a bank, even though legally, and I, as a lawyer saying, uh, we have uh, regulations that say it's the bank that takes the final call on the credit decision. Uh, often if the computer is saying, yes, it's going to be a really, really strong banker who is going to override that decision. Um, so when algorithmic processes become inputs into these kind of critical decisions, I think uh, there is this question around consumer protection and fairness in lending, which is why I've been listening very closely to some of those questions around explainability, because I think that's the really the first um, issue in, in, in the context of low income individuals is that um, there already there is such a kind of missing market uh, in some sense in that so many types of needs, insurance needs, payments needs, credit needs aren't met. So when they aren't met in an algorithmic process, it's even harder to tell whether that's just because of the way things are, or if there's some additional level of, um, you know, decision making happening. So I think that just further obfuscates the issue. So then the first big one there is just trying to understand what part of the decision, uh, what factor is driving the decision, a credit decision, insurance decision in one particular case. I guess the other quick thing I will say is, um, on the challenges side of things is also this idea of uh, so many different variables interacting all the time. Um, I think like uh, has been discussed and maybe we'll come back to that, Riff, uh, you know, in India, you have multiple axes of uh, discrimination for every low income household. So obviously not every low income household is the same. Uh, some households will suffer because they are at the lower end of the wealth distribution, but also because they have some kind of caste uh, disadvantages. Um, you know, gender is a big issue, which I'm happy to go back a little bit more into depth uh, in terms of some of the recent work that we've done as well. Uh, so given this is the case, again, it becomes even more difficult to see what is the specific variable that's driving that discrimination. So it's always, you know, it's not so clear, ju it's just caste or it's just race. It's often a multiplicity of these factors. And I think that again, obfuscates the issue. And I guess the last thing I will say is some of this is about the algorithm itself, uh, but I think a lot of it is just about the data. Um, I think one of the, you know, if an algorithm is just a technique, right? If you put bad data in, you're gonna get a bad decision out, again, speaking as a lawyer. Um, and I think that's where I think the data quality issues is something that I'm very keen to understand more because um, are there ways that we can work with algorithms to even understand what is the relevant data point? Um, because just to give you a sense, uh, you know, one of the things we know well now is that women use phones very differently from men in India. And depending on the cut of urban rural uh, wealth distribution and caste distribution and many other factors, uh, it, it can get less and less likely for a woman to own a phone or to use that phone. And we've been documenting that in two or three different states in India, which have very different cultures of mobile phone ownership. But a bank or an algorithmic scorer is going to use the same model across those cultures. And so the question, becomes, you know, what about a woman who never accesses the phone except maybe through a male me member of a household? And even so is very restricted. Uh, it either invisibilizes them or it gives an inaccurate picture of them, right? And so the question is um, almost, you know, how can we decide what of this new kind of data and what of these new kinds of patterns are actually reflective of the reality? So I guess those are kind of two or three big points that I leave with you, Rafe, but I'm, I'm kind of curious to learn more from all of you uh, at this discussion as well. I uh, can't hear you, Rip. Sorry, so it, it seems like in, in large part, it's really a supervisory challenge, right? And 
So maybe do you want, could I ask you to share a little bit on how you think we might more effectively monitor um, these biases or be able to say whether there's, there's kind of bad inputs and bad outcomes? Um, yeah, uh, so I, I can take a look at um, and I think I can already see David McGill is on this call, and he's been an enforcer of some of these models, so maybe he can uh, chip in. Uh, but uh, I mean, I think in the Indian context, it's kind of compounded by, for us by two things. The first is that we don't actually ha have fair credit reporting laws, fair housing acts. We don't have uh, horizontal anti-discrimination laws. Um, even within the financial sector. Um, so we have conduct rules, but they are pretty lightly enforced. They're not really an anti-discrimination statute. Um, so that I think is the first level of difficulty in terms of supervising entities, because we actually need the law first. I think the other um, sort of idiosyncrasy in India is that, uh, and which is matched in other contexts, is that many of these providers are not financial sector providers. So someone who's scoring or uh, tailoring an insurance product is just a technology service provider. So we don't, uh, you know, I, I'm not quite sure of the right answer to this, but surely we can't want our central bank or financial sector regulator to be regulating just a tech service provider on their algorithms. I, I don't actually think that's in their regulatory uh, mandate, but I think that opens up this question then of who, like, firstly, can anyone supervise this? And if so, who? I think the answers there though, um, the Singapore FinTech Festival is just going on. And yesterday there was a regulator that I was speaking to there uh, and they do it pretty well. They, I think reg tech solutions do exist. So I think a good algorithm to fight a bad algorithm, I guess is one answer, right? Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think in specific um, areas where there's enforcement, I know that there are detailed ways in which due process is audited. So the auditability of the algorithm itself, again, is something I'm sure Kathy and uh, everyone else on the call have a lot more to say about as well. Excellent, that's a great point. And maybe that sort of builds on um, one of the questions we've got from, from the audience. Um, you know, so uh, perhaps to, uh, to turn it to um, Kathy, Jake, Malavika, if you want to, um, share. Uh, so we have a question from, from Eric Duflo, um, you know, that the, the focus on outcomes uh, seems interesting, but are there examples of successes uh, with an with outcomes-based approach, um, you know, such as, you know, issues that have been identified um, through, through this approach? I don't know, um, Kathy, do you want to speak to that? Well, I mean, I think um, I think the most important point to make there is that most of the stuff you read about in the New York Times is obviously going to be outcomes based. You know, that's that's how people figure this stuff out, because they're like, wait a second, like this was really, uh, you know, it cut me off, but it let the, the, that guy through like what happened there. So it. You know, it's, it's the actual lived experience of the people that are targeted. Now, having said that, it doesn't happen enough. Like that's one of my biggest point, like most important points when I get to talk to policymakers is that the algorithmic harm is almost invisible. It's not entirely invisible. Sometimes we do see people figuring out, oh wait, this isn't fair to me. Um, but typically they're just like, oh, I, I got rejected. I don't know why. Um, there are special situations where uh, it becomes much more obvious because uh, you do know who else got the note, the answer, and you know it. So let, let me give you an example. The A levels uh, in the UK, the, the sort of algorithm they they replaced the actual tests with an algorithm to decide what the score would have been if someone had taken a test. And there's all sorts of questions about whether that even makes sense at a philosophical level. Um, but but whatever, however you want to think about it everyone got the, their results sort of at the same time. It was a hugely important uh, number for each of them because often their college um, acceptances were, um, were subject to like whether they did a, well enough on this, on this test. So if they got a bad score that prevented them to go to, from going to college, that really mattered to them. So there was a lot of conversation among those people and they kind of inferred based on the information they had, like this is not this makes no sense. There's no appeal system. They were being asked to pay, I think, to get an appeals and it was crazy. And, you know, 
as, as a person who critiques algorithms from afar, I'm like, oh yes, I'm glad to see that that particularly bad algorithm was like easy to figure out. Um, it was easy to like, so that the, the actual targets of the algorithm could figure out how flawed it was. Whereas the typical really bad algorithm, the targets just get rejected and they don't know why. Um, but anyway, the answer to your original question is, are there examples of an outcome-based approach working? And I'd say like, that's kind of the only success stories we really have. Um, but Malavika, I just wanted, to, if I could just respond to one comment you made, actually I'll respond in two ways to what you said. First of all, you guys might not have laws. So you're like, oh, we don't have laws. So that's the first time we have some of those laws, you know, the anti-discrimination laws, we, we're not enforcing them. Um, you know, for the most part, they're just not enforced. Um, so it's not just enough to have the laws, kind of like our struggle here, and I agree that we're like a couple steps ahead because we do have the laws. Our struggle here is to convince the regulators who are in charge of enforcing those laws. Yes, you actually have to step up and define what it means to be compliant with racial discrimination and hiring. You have to define that. You have to define what it means to be compliant with racial discrimination laws in credit. That isn't well defined yet. And until it is, every company is going to try to push for the weakest possible definition, which is the point I was trying to make earlier. But the final thing I'll say is like, once the regulators do enforce these laws, which I do expect them to start pretty soon, it will be outcomes based because that's the only way it can be. Like you're, you're not gonna prove intentional racism by data scientists. They're just following the data, right? You're not gonna, you're not gonna really, and Jake did a beautiful job of explaining all these different approaches to like choosing your attributes correctly. Um, even the one that was like decorrelate um, your attributes from race, because we were focused on race. Well, in a, in a world where everybody's only using linear regression, that, that could theoretically make a dent. But if we're not using linear regression, because we're not anymore, you know, we're, using, we're in the world of neural networks, who knows what that does? Maybe nothing. Um, the point is that like, you, there's really very little else you can do considering the complex complexity and, uh, and obscurity from the actual designers of the algorithm, there's little else you could do then think about outcomes-based types of audits. I'll just finish by saying that when, when people who don't know anything about algorithms ask me, what does it mean to audit an algorithm? I say, well, I don't do very much different than sociologists have been doing for years and years. When they are trying to audit like, um, a sort of, let's say, law internships, summer internships for law students, uh, what they do is they send a bunch of applications that are identical except for the name. Like black, sounds like a black man, sounds like a black woman, sounds like a white man, sounds like a white woman. And they figure out, guess what, every single time that it's racist and sexist in different ways, depending on uh, other things. But um, it's like, that is kind of obviously outcomes-based audit, right? They're not, they're not asking, why did you, except this person for an interview, why did you reject that person? They're not trying to understand the algorithm, the process, right? They're just saying who got an interview and who didn't. That's outcomes-based auditing. And so I think of um, algorithmic auditing writ large as a kind of automated way of doing question, answering and asking and answering questions like that. Excellent, thank you. Um, Jake, I don't know if you wanted to add anything regarding the outcomes-based approaches. Sure, I'll, I'll throw in one thing, uh, which is, it kind of builds on a different point, uh, Malavika, from what you said, um, asking about bad data in, you know, bad results out, um, and thinking of the outcomes in that sense, and to flag one example of uh, what I see as a help, helpful outcomes-based regime is like uh, offering standard data sets or benchmarking data sets um, for very particular areas of technology. So that's happened um, here in the U.S. with facial recognition. Uh, NIST, which is the National Institute for Standards and Technology, so maybe I've got their name wrong, uh, a government agency has started um, doing a, uh, a regular benchmarking of facial recognition systems and specifically quantifying their performance on um, different skin tones and different genders. So the gender shades study that Kathy mentioned earlier, which was not done by NIST, uh, 
that sort of surfaced the problem, and then NIST decided to take, uh, you know, take a, a, a take a more active role in um, uh, benchmarking these systems. So there's still a question whether a single benchmark is really relevant to every situation where it's going to be deployed, and the answer is no. There's still a huge amount of context-specific thinking that you have to do when you're going to deploy facial recognition in any particular area. But the benchmarking really does help. It helps um, It helps individuals or, or, like, helps companies choose between providers because they really are being, um, you know, measured against the same scale. Um, it helps see whether providers are improving over time. Um, I, I guess like any uh, – like any set of rules or benchmarks, it's susceptible to gaming. So like, you know, companies can try to optimize their system's performance just against the NIST benchmark, even if its deployment in reality is gonna, you know, behave otherwise. Um, so there are there are still gaps in that, but I think it's an interesting start. Uh, you can also, if there's a benchmarking data set, um, then everybody can, like presumably that benchmarking data set is revealed at some point and everybody can um, criticize whether it's truly representative or whether it's, you know, appropriate. So like it, it adds a level of transparency um, uh, that I think can be helpful to start anyway. Yes, please. I was just, if I can just quickly, I guess the one additional thing that I'm interested in is also obviously, you know, outcomes based auditing is one thing, but I think um, as you know, when you think about consumer protection, that's already too late. So I think one thing that we've been uh, trying to work with some, some computer scientists here in India, especially Professor Subhashish Banerjee and his team, um, I should say, is what can we do ex ante, right? So what can you, what are some techniques that are algorithms? And I think that's uh, something that, you know, a lot of uh, data scientists and so software engineers are already doing. Um, and my sister's one, she always says, you know, how about can we have more engineering in software engineering, which is really doing all the safety checks, right? The structural audits that you would before a building starts. And I think some of the interesting things that, um, I know a few people are experimenting with is just logging all decisions and irrespective of whether that affects sales or not uh, in, as a financial pro provider is just going through that, going through all the logs uh, just as a matter of course. Uh, I think documentation, simple things like that, but also uh, I think model validation, I think more and more people are doing additional tiers of model validation from what I understand in the financial industry and just generally going back to assumptions time and again. And I think, you know, I've seen this with a few providers, including Jumo, where when they see that there is a um, one part of their portfolio that they are serving less because it doesn't hit their social impact indicators, then they actually try and go back and say, why are we serving fewer of these kinds of groups than we are? So I think those kinds of proactive tools, uh, I'm just curious to see, you know, is there something we can do before the harm occurs as well? Um, and that's just Again, just something I wanted to put out there. Say it's not all after the fact, hopefully. And I hope Kathy, there's some thinking on that front as well. Yeah, I mean, this is a great example, uh, Malavika, of like the kind of the kind of answer that that you get when you ask the question, "What could go wrong?" Right. So you ask, "What could go wrong?" And the idea is, um, and for whom? Right. Um, and the idea is, you think very broadly in an audit, uh, at least the way we do it. It's like, you know, you could even think um, this is bad for the environment. Like the stakeholder could be the environment. This is just bad for the environment. Um, and from the environment's perspective, so you have to have a representative for the environment speaking on behalf of the environment. Um, this is what, you know, this is wasteful uh, of, of energy. And it, it, it's, you know, we could do almost as much with using a third of the energy. Um, and I'm thinking right now of the like very large language algorithms being uh, discussed uh, at Google um, and that, you know, uh, you also have, um, you also have monitors set up, like, because in an audit, what we would do is like, well, we don't know if something's going wrong right now, but we, and in fact, we don't even have the data to, to measure the extent to which it's going wrong because we haven't been collecting that, but let's collect that from now on and monitor it. And like, this is something that is sort of like, we set up a little scaffolding around the algorithm in the context of the algorithm to say, 
you know, the, it's like a car is running, but you need those dials on the car to make sure the gas isn't running out and, and it's not, the engine isn't running too hot. And not to mention that you have these, uh, you have seat belts to, to protect the people inside, you know? So like you want to, you want to sort of build the, the, uh, the architecture that, that not only, um, make sure that the algorithm is working for the people who own it, but working for all the, all the stakeholders in this situation on an ongoing basis, if that helps. And by the way, I wanted to mention the other thing uh, to respond to your earlier um, comment, which I remembered. I got many emails um, from Indian data scientists over the years asking, you know, oh, is it okay if I use like cast as a variable, an attribute in like in measure in, in for credit algorithms? And, and I'm like, well, what do you mean? What is it all right? Are you using it to decide um, whether to offer someone a loan? Like, it sounds really worrisome to me. Um, but it's it's like that. That seemed to be a sort of live question, not so long ago. Um, so I do feel like there's a lot of analogies to be drawn um, between the, the the kinds of fields what we're working on. So, I wanted to ask. Um, We've had uh, some a few questions that touch on a similar follow-up to this, which is, are there any, um, we have both questions regarding financial service providers and regulators, whether you've seen any approaches um, to dealing with these ethical issues that you, that you would, you know, recognize as sort of good practices or thing or, um, or successful approaches we can learn from. I don't know if any of you have seen in your perspective in your uh, work, any examples you want to highlight on the positive side? Um, yeah, I'm going to let Jake answer that after I say one little thing. Um, but I would say that uh, the answer is, as I said again before, we haven't really seen much actual regulation yet. But there are some good ideas that I think we might be able to try to generalized to the world of credit that are coming from facial recognition again. There's been a lot of work on the facial recognition front. And one of the things that um, the, the young people at to the Gender Shades Project came up with was having a kind of gold standard training or testing set, I should say, um, which is, as you can imagine, got quite a few women of color in it as, as much as white men. Like, it's like the, one of the problems, the underlying problems with the original training set was it's like white, mostly white men. Um, so the idea would be there, you'd have this sort of, sort of standardized gold standard testing set. And you're like, if you think your facial recognition algorithm is doing well, like we like you to test it against this set here and then show us what the results are. So the idea would be to have something along those lines, but for credit, um, algorithms to see um, whether it was functioning well on a diverse set of people. The problem with that, or the obstacle that we need to overcome, I'm not sure it's if it's po possible to overcome it, is that the thing about big data credit fintech algorithms is that they ask all sorts of questions. Like they have questionnaires, I assume, um, that uh, any given gold standard data set might not have all those fields. Like if they ask like, did you have a childhood pet? I mean, I'm just throwing that out there, but you never know with data science, you know? You never know with big data algorithms. If they ask if you have a childhood pet, like there's no way that the gold standard is gonna already have that as a, as a column in the matrix of the, in the database. Um, on the other hand, part of the uh, future of enforcement for algorithms could be, as Jake pointed out, like you're only allowed to use these. And then if we had that restriction on like the attributes that you are allowed to use, then it would be theoretically possible to have something along those lines. I mean, I guess what I'm saying is that the facial recognition example um, is, is special because all, the, the, the input is simply a picture. And it's not that, not that like video or uh, picture analysis is, is easy whatsoever, but I'm saying at least it's a well-defined concept of what is the input. Whereas with, um, with FinTech algorithms, the input can vary wildly. And so it'd be hard to Im imagine doing this perfectly, but it's, it's an approach that I think is worth, very much worth thinking about. And it's also an approach that uh, I think regulators could really understand. They could, they could like have this gold standard 
and they could say everybody needs to test their algorithm against this and they could understand what the results might mean. So it's at least at least it's doable. But Jake, I want to hand it over to you to answer that question if you have another. Yeah, I have a thought. Um, and I'm going to try to give this thought with video on, uh, and a phone next to me. Um, so, uh, Ray, to your question, is there an example um, in the financial space that worked? Uh, I have an example that didn't quite work, um, but maybe it's instructive. Uh, so a year, year and a half ago, maybe two years, a fintech lender here in the U.S., um, they took the approach of going to the regulator with their predictive model in hand and saying, because there's not a clear regulatory regime yet, as Kathy has mentioned, um, because there's not a, a clear set of rules, we're just going to show you our algorithm as is, you know, and we'd like you to write this thing called the no action letter, um, which w was a commitment not to investigate or um, uh, I don't know what the right legal term is, not to like go after them for their model being unfair. So they, they tried to be proactive, approach the regulator um, and say, in the absence of regulation, we just want to show you we have, we have nothing to hide and we'd like you to like bless this, um, this, you know, predictive model. So I think in, initially they did get such a thing, a no action letter. It had an expiration date on it. And the, in the time since, um, it seems it seems like commentary is uh, that that wasn't a great approach for a couple of reasons. One, the predictive model is updated so frequently that you know it's hard to know exactly what they reviewed and said was not objectionable. How similar is the version of the model that's running? You know, some weeks or months later. Um, it also is obviously it's like a very one-off approach. Um, it relies on the company coming forward to the regulator. So like it's, it's far from a comprehensive approach. And you would imagine like the, the people that raise their hand or come to the regulator with the model is probably not the people you're most worried about um, behaving badly in the first place. So it, not a complete answer at all, but um, maybe worth uh, noting as an example. And maybe just as a follow-up, I mean, so this ethical matrix, um, got a few questions along this line, you know, how has this been received when you presented this to, um, to actors? I mean, not uh, financial services, but maybe other industries. I'd love to hear if you're getting sort of positive receptivity or, or what the experience has been so far. You know, it's, uh... I'm going to be honest with you, there's not enough leverage for us to foist our approach on uh, companies that have not had their laws enforced. So typically our clients are companies that either have a third party that need, that doesn't, doesn't trust their algorithm, but they really need that trust, or they're a company that has had a, a sort of d debacle with respect to uh, reputational risk. And they need to get uh, to show that they're doing better. Um, we've had a lot of calls with industries that have these unenforced regulations. In, in uh, we've had, and these calls are really good because there's a data scientist in you know a senior data scientist who's like, I read your book, Kathy, and I'm really worried about the embedded historical bias, uh, and you know want to do something about it. The first call goes great. The second call, the lawyer of the company is online and says, no, this is not happening. Um, it, basically it's a plausible deniability issue that they don't want to break. You know, in particular, they, what they don't wanna do, they often ask the question, what if you find a mistake, we, a, a problem we can't fix? So they don't wanna be on record even, you know, if, it, if it's sort of semi-hidden um, that they knew there was a problem with their algorithm, um, but they kept using it. Because then they feel like they're the tobacco companies that knew that tobacco killed, but they sat on that research. So I, I'm I'm kind of I'm, I'm projecting a little bit, but it is a consistent thing. We've talked to people in insurance, we've talked to people um, in uh, in credit. We've you know, and often they're like really like, oh yeah, this is really important. This is this is a good idea. This should happen, but they don't actually need to make it happen at that moment. So it the the real the, for us like we are working 
you know, with firms that are just like, we don't care if we could get in trouble legally. We, we need to do this. Uh, often the people that hire us are like, I'm going to quit if, if this doesn't happen. You know, this needs to happen. They're very, very important. They consider it very important. Or we're now working with regulators themselves on what does it mean? Uh, you know, this company is suspected. And sometimes those regulators have subpoena power. So it's like the attorney general's office or something. And they're like, well, we think that this is, this is really going wrong. Here's the data. And so it's an adversarial audit, if you will. So that's, that's a kind of unsatisfying answer to your question. I, I do think that the, uh, the paradigm, the ethical matrix paradigm, it's not, the, uh, it's not the only paradigm. There's a lot of ways to do this, but you could, and you could simply just ask, what, is it, what do you think it means to be compliant with these anti-discrimination laws? And how are you doing it? Uh, what's the evidence that what you're doing is not racist? That would be a very simple question you, that you could ask that I would argue most companies would not know how to answer or would not want to answer. Well, you're certainly confirming my priors about self-regulation, so. <laughs> um, so um, yeah. I, um, we have a few I'll more copies. Yeah, sorry, sorry, go ahead. Um, just to, Kathy, what you said um, chimes with something I saw in the chat window here. Uh, David Medine um, said like exactly what you suggested. Can we just ask companies to prove that what they're doing, what they're proposing to use is not discriminatory, um, which, you know, we think is a, a great place to start in our discussions when we have talked with regulators. That's how we suggest um, the first step we suggest them taking usually is go and ask the industry, what are you doing currently, you know, in your own house to make sure you're compliant with these vaguely defined um, laws. So starting from what companies are doing and then asking, you know, asking whether it's uh, whether it's high quality and, and keeping the best parts of it and building on that. Um, I wanted to, there's a question, sorry, Malavika, do you want to go? And then I was going to pick on you for the India specific question as well. Okay. No, I just very quickly, not to take up too much time, but I also feel a lot of these questions could probably be solved by just doing decent data protection. Because I think a lot of this is just, uh, you know, how much data are you collecting and how much data do you need to make one particular uh, decision? So I think just this idea of purpose limitation, right? And just testing legitimacy. So why do you need my mother's blood group if you need to give me a loan? Like, I think sometimes uh, part of this is just like basic 101 data protection. Do you need the data? Is it for this? And I think that reducing the complexity of the data input something as a non-data scientist, I think that would at least help audit the inputs against the output. So I would say just one plug for just basic data protection law, even in countries which don't have anti-discrimination laws, for instance, like India. Excellent. Um, and now specifically to India, um, there was a question uh, for you saying, it seems striking there are few regulations and these firms assessing credit can avoid regulation as financial en entities. Is this changing at all? And how do you see the fintech space for alternative lending changing or evolving? Um, hi, yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, yeah. Uh, so it's interesting because it is changing. Uh, I think, um, so what's happening is that we are seeing kind of bespoke regulations for particular types of fintechs coming out with uh, requirements that, you know, the rules for matching, say for instance, in the context of P2P lenders, there's a requirement now when those regulations came uh, to regulate P2P platforms giving loans that the rules that match lenders and borrowers must be equitable and non-discriminatory. Now, I don't know how that's applied, but it's there. And there's also a requirement to publicly disclose um, broad credit assessment methodology, right? Which is quite controversial. Now, this, the sad thing is, um, I think the regulator, the pushback has been that it's selectively only applied to one type of FinTech. So if I'm just an alternative scorer who's not also arranging a peer-to-peer -peer lending, then I'm actually better off than a peer-to-peer -peer lender, right? Um, so I think the, the issue is, uh, there's kind of an as asymmetric uh, regulatory burden. And I think the idea of fintechs itself, there are so many fintechs, right? So as a bank and as an NBFC leveraging fine, uh, technology, 
you would actually do, you do have certain kinds of bounds on your decision making for uh, uh, credit decisions and the, the like. Then you have this kind of middle, you know, semi-regulated fintechs, and then you have technology service providers who provide services to banks who are totally unregulated. Um, so that's the state of play in terms of whether it's changing. Um, I think I, I'm actually surprisingly, I'm not in uh, favor of a large change. Uh, I actually think right now the issue is that there's no grievance and there's no contestability of the decision from the consumer side or within the institution, right? Uh, and as long as there's liability there within a bank or a financial institution, then and you have some contestability system, that risk should price itself. I think now the problem is the banks are just able to buy these models or get service providers in without understanding them. The service providers are just doing what they do for advertising to, for, for finance, and there's no feedback loop, basically. Um, so I think the liability model right now is okay in that the bank is holding the risk of a bad model. But I think the problem is in the absence of a feedback loop, banks don't have any, you know, they just buy what looks good on a pitch deck, I think, at the risk of making a generalization. I think that's probably what we need to fix. Thank you. All right, one more question. It's a, it's a tricky one. Um, it's a good one from Matthew. It says, we often hear a lot about explainability as a potential tool to fight against bias or discriminatory outcomes resulting from algorithms. Um, and so this gets at the point of contestability that was just raised. What are your perspectives on explainability as an effective strategy? And Matthew also notes, he's read critiques of this tool, that it could be a distraction or reflect a, a transparency fallacy. Yeah, I'm gonna go with that. If we, I'll start. Um, first of all, explainability isn't well-defined, you know, like as a, I have a story uh, Facebook introduced a why are you seeing this ad um, feature and an Italian uh, Italian journalist was investigating it and he was a lefty journalist um, and he would look at why am I seeing this ad and it would be like because this is where you are etc cetera, etc cetera. then he joined a sort of right-wing something some kind of right-wing Facebook group and he saw like within a half an hour saw an ad for uh, like that right wing cause. And he clicked on, why am I seeing this ad? And it said, because you're over the age of 13 and you're in this area. Um, and so like, technically it's an explanation but it's not the explanation that we care about. And so it, if you think through that a little bit just on a philosophical level, like what we really mean when we say we want an explanation is we want we want to know sort of the most salient factor or the most recent factor or some kind of combination of what's interesting to me, which is really hard for, you know, I mean, even if we really earnestly tried to build an expl expl explanation engine, it would be really tricky, um, really, really tricky and possibly impossible. Um, so I don't think that's very useful per se. Having said that, like, I think sensitivity analyses are really sometimes very useful. Like I, sometimes I would like to be able to fiddle with the inputs that I represent to see how much things would change if these inputs change a little bit. So if I had a control, if I had a control board and I was allowed to tune my inputs um, freely to see how my score would change, that probably would give me a little bit more understanding of the algorithm that's scoring me. Um, that's not the same thing as an explanation at all. So I, I do think explanations sound like a solution, but they end up being much more useful to obscure true things um, than they sound. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I honestly, and yeah, so I'll, I'll stop there because I, I think I'll just say one last thing, which is that having said that, there's there are some things where I do feel like disclosure more generally is really important, um, even constitutionally required. So there are examples like for scores that you might get as a defendant, a criminal defendant, like in sentencing or parole or um, pretrial um, pretrial incarceration, where like they are they're actually scoring you with these algorithms that nobody understands and they're opaque. And I feel like that should be. That should not, that should sort of violate due process rights. So in that context where you actually have a constitutional right to, 
disclosure and explanation, I, I would make an exception for that where you should have complete transparency. But I think even there, it's not just explainability, it's a kind of more radical transparency. We'd have to have a different conversation about what that would look like. Radical transparency, I like that idea. Um, so we're at the hour and a half mark. Thank you everyone for the participation and the really excellent questions. And I mean, just Malavika, Kathy, Jake, thank you so much. I, I feel like I was I got schooled in this past 90 minutes. This was really great. Um, my last thing I would say besides appreciation for everyone is um, I would love to see a researcher lens applied to some of these burning questions. And so that's something from my PA side that um, it would be wonderful yourselves or those on the um, on the call, if you have thoughts or reflections on how we um, how we could use our consumer protection research initiative to advance this type of work, um, I would love to, to further the conversation. Um, maybe before we leave, I don't know if either any of you want to have any final final remarks um, or reflections uh, before before we adjourn. I just wanted to say thank you for having Jake. us. It's super fascinating. I was going to say the very same thing. Plus, um, feel free to contact us at hello at orcarisk.com. If anything um, piqued your interest, you know, uh, we're, we would love to hear from you. Uh, I was just going to say thank you as well. And that I forgot uh, we didn't get to pick up on this point of commensurability, Ray, but maybe that's, oh, that's true. <laughs> maybe this will yeah. change, but I yeah, I just wonder. <laughs> maybe for a different well, for a well, we could possibly do a round two of this. Um, we have some research coming out of IPA from the Dominican Republic that maybe we need to share in January. Um, yeah, this is a huge topic. Um, someone said they now feel more afraid. And was that the point? Maybe it was. <laughs> so thank you all for such a great reality check and in-depth um, deep dive. And um, yeah, everyone have a wonderful rest of the the day and um, we look forward to um, working further on this topic with all of you.